Hey, Steve Yanni here at Burnison Auto Wrecking in Burnison, Massachusetts, doing the junkyard crawl with a 1981 Toyota SR5. Now, the SR5 arrived in the mid-1970s, standing for Sport Runabout five-speed manual transmission. Now, I don't think ever before a vehicle had been marketed based on the number of gears in its transmission, but the whole punchline with that five-speed transmission was overdrive in fifth gear, which saved fuel. More on that in a second. But this one here, this is a member of the third generation Toyota pickup truck family. These were made between 1979 and 1983. And these were the, um, the first year for a Toyota pickup, or the first generation, to go from coil spring front suspension to torsion bars. Uh, and again, uh, the first pickup trucks imported to the United States from Toyota were the Stouts of 1968. Uh, but again, uh, this one here is the a third generation, which again arrived in 79. And here we have the torsion bars. Here's one right here. And these things are anchored at the back and they uh, pivot with the lower front control arm right there. There's one on each side, one down here. And these are often associated with Chrysler vehicles, you know, Chrysler B bodies, A bodies, E bodies from oh, 1957 through 1986, um, whatever it was, uh, would have torsion bar front suspension. But you gotta remember that General Motors GMC trucks had torsion bar front suspension from 60 through 62. In fact, we did a video on a five ton Chevrolet truck with torsion bar front suspension. So the beauty of torsion bar suspension, it gets away from big coil spring towers in the engine bay, and it also it's lighter and often gives better handling without the marshmallow field. It can sometimes come with coil springs. Now again, uh, 1978 was the first year for four-wheel drive in Toyota pickup trucks. From 68 to 78, U.S. imports were all two-wheel drive, rear-wheel drive that is. And this one here being a Gen 3, this is also the final family uh, all the way through 1983 with a solid front axle and leaf springs. The fourth gen went to independent front suspension, which is way harder to jack up. So if you ever watch Back to the Future with Michael J. Fox, remember he had an SR5 four-wheel drive with a lift kit that looked so cool. But again, this one's a two-wheel drive, as most of them were. Now we can learn from this one a little bit. This tag here says 22R. What that tells us, this was born with a 2.4 liter or 145 cubic inch inline four. It was an overhead cam design. Uh, 145 cubic inches an outgrowth of the 20R, which was a uh, two liter engine. Uh, these have uh, larger bore. And again, uh, pretty powerful engine. Now, 1981 was the final year for carburation. EFI arrived in 1982. So a transitional year, but again, 81, this is the first year for the big 2.4 in your SR5. Uh, also kind of interesting too, they went to the round headlights, uh, one of the few domestic or imported vehicles without square lights, but it gave Toyota a unique look. Datsun by this time, I think, was using uh, square headlights, which were in vogue for sure, but uh, the Toyota stood apart a little bit for its round headlights. And again, these were classic trucks, 79 through 83. I saw these on the road everywhere. And that whole SR5 thing was about the overdrive fifth gear. And we'll see that in a second. But something on these, it's kind of cool. Um, these have the same bolt pattern as Mopars, or at least, you know, B body and E body and C body Mopars. This is the uh, five on four and a half. And this wheel right here uh, is actually a pretty rare piece. This is the kind of wheel right here you'd find on a 68 Super B or Roadrunner. It's a 15 by five and a half. It's a half inch wider. And if you look right here, it looks a little deeper. That's because this is essentially the station wagon wheel, also used on C-body wagons. But this is a rare, pretty rare wheel. By comparison, this deep dish look here isn't seen on this more mundane, just regular Mopar wheel. So <clears throat> these wheels are in favor with people who want to, uh, you know, restore a road one in the proper way. And yeah, they bolt right onto Toyotas. And I don't know what it is. A lot of these Toyota trucks seem to have these Chrysler wheels on them. Um, I have to do some research. Possible that motor wheel that made these wheels might have had a surplus, and perhaps these were a dealer item. Not sure but I see a lot of these Toyota trucks with Mopar wheels on them. I don't know what that's about. They bolt right on. But here in the back, uh, we do see, here's the five-speed manual transmission. Now, this is an iron case. This is the W50. These were also done in aluminum, and it wasn't really a particular thing, cars and trucks. It wasn't like the trucks got the iron case, cars got the aluminum. It went either way. These are a little heavier, but again, the beauty of this five-speed tranny is it's point 
0.85 overdrive. So it takes, oh, like a four to one rear axle ratio, knocks 15% off the RPMs on the highway and saves gas. But one difference between the truck five speed and the passenger car five speed is the first gear ratio. The trucks have a 395, 3.95 to one first gear ratio. Uh, the cars have a 3.65 to one first gear ratio. And the bottom line there is that they, Toyota knew that trucks would be more heavily loaded. So the extra mechanical advantage or torque multiplication of that 3.95 to one ratio versus the car's 365 would help the truck move a little better than, uh, than a car. But otherwise, these transmissions are also found in Celicas um, and a pretty, pretty tough tranny right here. Good for 250 horsepower if you're kind to it. So not a bad piece. But again, the fifth gear in this was the magic. And this is what gave the SR5 its name, the fifth gear. In other words, it's, I've, I can't think of another time that an automatic or a, a transmission was used in the marketing and the naming of a vehicle. But again, in the mid seventies, OPEC and CAFE and fuel economy were such serious things that uh, any measure to reduce fuel economy or con consumption uh, was a step in the right direction. Other stuff we see in the bed of this thing are just a lot of pine needles. And one thing about pine needles, they might look cute, but these things are acidic. When these things uh, get wet, they turn acidic and they eat metal. So this truck's bed is shot. If we look underneath this bumper here, you can kind of see right through the bed. <laughs> look at that. Wow. Unbelievable. But yeah, pine needles are pretty, but they're not your friend by any stretch, unless it's Christmas morning. Uh, here's the original air cleaner. Again, 1981 final year for a carburetor. Uh, pretty sure that's the original air cleaner on this thing. Would be an EFI system for 82, a whole different thing, a box. Um, Kind of cool, the head pipe right here. There's one on the truck, but here's a second one. And the 22R engine has a split exhaust manifold for less back pressure. The two pipes go into this head pipe here. They do merge into a single and then from here into a catalytic converter. But you know, the 22R was a pretty, pretty good engine, a, a high breather and uh, a single overhead cam design. This is kind of weird right here. This is a Toyota rocker cover, but this is from an earlier Hemi head Toyota motor, not an overhead cam, but a push rod engine. But again, just like a miniature Chrysler Hemi with the spark plug tubes and wires that go down inside, right inside, and here they are. But this is kind of a cool thing. On Chrysler Hemi heads, they're stamped tin. Uh, they're prone to leakage and warpage. And the spark plug tubes are separate with a little rubber O-ring. They tend to leak, whereas Toyota kind of had their stuff together. This one piece casting with these integral spark plug tubes that seal against the head and uh, less leaks. And again, being cast aluminum with a nice machine face, uh, minimal leakage, minimal warpage. So kind of cool, but a baby Hemi right here. This is not the valve cover or cam cover or rocker cover, excuse me, for this truck. Again, this would have been an overhead cam with a smooth cover and a, a cam and a, a, a timing belt at the front of it. But uh, again, a sad thing to see this puppy in the junkyard here. I can't get the doors open. But we can definitely see, you know, the inside of um, the hole in the floor where the SR5 five-speed manual transmission once uh, stood proud. And again, you know, the side of this thing is shot. It's gone. Another one of those Mopar 14 by five and a half Roadrunner wheels right there, the deep dish look. These wheels are, are kind of neat. Again, if you're restoring a Roadrunner or a Super B and you want the, the low-fi bottle cap, these are the right wheels for that right here. Yeah, they're 14 inches on Roadrunners, except for Hemi's. But the bed on this thing is, is a nice piece, rusty, but it's kind of cool with the little hooks here for, for cargo and uh, just utility, you know, a lot of utility baked into these things. Now, I don't remember seeing these ever in any kind of a step side configuration. The bed on these was always the, uh, the style side, as they call it in, in GM land, but the, the fleet side at the back. Uh, I believe there was a long wheelbase version of this thing. But anyway, these things were all over the road here in New England back in uh, the late 70s, early 80s. I remember them very well as a kid. But this one's driving days are probably over. Um, it's a good example of, um, you know, Toyota marketing, fuel economy, and sport. You know, the sport runabout five, SR5 uh, pickup truck right here. Now at the same time, uh, Nissan or Datsun was getting into their hard body phase with independent front suspensions on four wheel drive trucks. And they were a little harder to, to lift. Lift kits on, on Nissan four wheel drive trucks were problematic, whereas the Toyotas in this third gen, again, with the leaf springs up front and the straight axle lifted with a set of shackles or blocks, no problem. But again, here it is, the end of the line for the Gen 3 Toyota pickup truck. These things are getting to be 20,000 bucks in good shape. So I dare say the glass on this one in certain parts could still be hard Harvested, but for the vehicle itself, it's probably a little too far gone. But again, watch in 25 years, we'll say, I can't believe I walked away from that rusted truck. It wasn't that bad. Everything eventually has its day, and but in the end, rust wins. But if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to Steve Mag's YouTube channel, and we'll be back tomorrow with more.